because we've actually gone through some webinars that we've recorded and then we forgot to download it or we forgot to initially record it. So reminders are helpful for everybody as we're learning new routines um, with the work that we're doing. Also, if you've um, attended the webinars last month, um, there was a lot of requests that the webinars um, be in PowerPoint format and we made some assumptions that they were, but they're uploaded in PDF and we apologize if we said, no, no, they're PowerPoints. Um, so all documents are uploaded in PDF form. And if you are interested in the PowerPoint, we're happy to send that to you. You're just gonna have to email us and you'll see our email addresses at the end of this PowerPoint. And they're up there as PDFs uh, for a very good reason, because in the PDF format, there are lots more opportunities and ways uh, for people that might be hard of hearing um, uh, multiple different handicapping conditions so that they can also make use of the, of the webinar. So, all right. So our objectives for today um, are really to provide and remind ourselves of those PBIS principles for how we respond to minor misbehaviors and specifically talking about how do we take what we know to the virtual classroom and how do we make use of what we've already done and bring that to the virtual classroom, um, build off of what we have done already with our students. And then we're gonna also talk about examining some keys to success for how we're gonna respond to those challenges in our virtual classroom. Our expectations today are that we're gonna be respectful and we're gonna do that by using the chat box. And that's how we're gonna ask questions and answer any prompts that we come up with today so that we can learn from each other. Christy's manning the chat box because I have not built the skill set to uh, do the PowerPoint and the chat box. You don't want me to I'm go. I'm still first. learning too. So she's man manning those for us. And I'll um, be putting links up along the way. Right. And then um, we want to make sure that we're being safe. So we're going to continue our safe at home protocol and use our physical, physical distancing which in California looks like is gonna continue um, for quite a while and we're gonna be working on how do we work in both places, the virtual classroom and the in-person classroom. Uh, we wanna make sure that we're responsible uh, so that we can increase our social emotional connections more than ever. Uh, when you get invited to a breakout room, be sure to join and then you will unmute yourself and be able to introduce yourselves and have a conversation. All right, so let's get started. So imagine this scenario. One day you're spending time with your students in this physical, positive, nurturing, safe, educational environment. And the next day, boom, you're in this virtual, remote, new way of learning classroom. So we want you to use the chat box to respond to this prompt. What do you miss the most from your classroom and life at school? So go ahead and be thinking about that. It's a reflective kind of question. And while you're adding to the chat box, there are some responses that teachers across the country have been saying, and you guys can see what some of those are. Barb, if you go back a slide. Oh, okay. I thought that was on this side. <laughs> it seems that it, our teachers are really missing that human connection if you think about that, the hugs, the giggles, the energy, um, the joy, interaction, people are saying, the space and time to do things uninterrupted, good one, face-to-face <laughs> -face interactions, oh, human connection, okay, again, being able to quickly respond to students' moods and needs, plus being able to joke with them, yeah, it's kind of hard to joke during that virtual like back and forth, isn't it? Yeah, hugs, hugs and hugs and laughter. Yeah, so it's kind of just nice to reflect on what is it that we're really missing right now? And there was really an interesting webinar that I listened to, and Barb, you can go to the next um, slide. And it was a conversation with students. And that was um, done with the Midwest Equity consortium and they asked students what they missed and there were just a couple of things from their responses and these students were of all ages and so we kind of gathered and synthesized the information and so what we have learned from our kids is that during this remote learning time 
we need to be empathetic and aware of the spectrum of emotions our students might be experiencing right now. Because our students are really craving this consistency and predictability. They need that instructive um, way to understand the routines and schedules that are going to be new to them um, with remote learning. And most importantly, our students miss us and they miss each other. They miss having this second family that we've created, the relationships that we've built. So make sure you reach out for reassurance, which I know we all have. And when you are instructing remotely, remember to provide opportunities for peer connection, for them to be able to express how they're feeling with each other, um, and then being able to take that in other settings like back in their home. So as always, we want to make sure that we are grounding the work that we do in the tiered fidelity inventory because this is an evidence-based practice, which is wonderful for us now because we can fall back on that, knowing that these principles are going to get us the results that we're looking for. So in this particular webinar, we're really hooking into those discipline policies. And I'd like to be reminded of two quotes from Dr. Horner. One is, we really don't correct something if we haven't taught it. So we need to remember how important it is that as you define your behavioral expectations and the behaviors that you have online are in your remote learning, we also need to make sure that we're teaching what that looks like. So what does it look like when you are signing in or using the chat box or moving around in your, in your home while you're on video? Um, and until we've defined, taught, modeled, and practiced and reinforced and retaught those, it's really unethical for adults to punish. So we just can't go to that punish first or those consequences first. We need to make sure that we're doing these practices, these evidence-based practice. We wanna be proactive and preventative. We wanna make sure we're staying positive and we want it to be instructive and restorative. And we're gonna talk about each of these today and how you'll do that online. We're also going to look at the tiered fidelity inventory that relates to the classroom practices. Um, and these are those features that include school-wide expectations. We've talked about those in past webinars, the routines um, that we wanna teach, how we do acknowledgements, um, how we do acknowledgements online and how important that is. We talked about that last week. And then we wanna look at building an in-class continuum of consequences. So we're gonna talk, that's what our um, topic is about today. In this continuum, we want to make sure that it's proactive and it's instructive and that it's restorative. It's important for us to remember that when we're responding to problem behavior, it's really making sure that we're staying instructive. And we're going to go through steps to be able to do that today. We want to teach those resiliency skills and we do that in the way that we teach kids how to handle problems and how we're going to handle the problems that we might be having with our students. We want to be working on replacing those learned responses um, with the taught appropriate behaviors so that helps kids with self-regulation. And one of the things we have to think about, a lot of our kids have some online behaviors. They've been doing gaming for a long time. And so we have to make sure that those gaming habits are the way that they were with gaming. Their previously learned responses online aren't what they're doing in our classrooms with us. So right now, we'd like you to think about what are some of those um, misbehaviors that are happening in your remote learning. So use the chat box. Again, Christy's going to man it for us and be able to report out some of the things that we're hearing. You guys can all see it. She's reporting it out really for my benefit. Um, what are some minor misbehaviors that are happening for you during your remote learning? Let's make a list of those. Just take a minute here. I think that key word you said was minor misbehavior. Yeah. Kids shouting on unrelated comments, chatting in chat room, kids getting distracted by TV or radio, unmuting themselves, kids getting up and walking away, using the chat box to talk with other students, students not turning in work, typing anybody, anybody had where kids are changing their virtual backgrounds all the time in the back? Constantly playing in backgrounds. Background. <laughs> That's right there, Barb. Yeah, yeah. Yes, 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 and yes. 
the not to worry about not showing, showing up at all. Yeah. yeah. I'm working I, with I get to use not showing up at all is really a major um, yeah. behavior. And there are lots of reasons why, but in this webinar, we're not going to talk about things that we can do for those that aren't showing up. Um, email at one or two in the morning, e emails at one or two in the morning, right? making silly faces on the camera, freezing and talking. Okay, so we get that idea. Great. Mark. I think some of those one or two a.m. in the mornings might be high school. So that's one of the problems we're having with the middle and the high school kids is they're yeah. doing this when they want to and yeah. not necessarily, you know, when it's, yeah. when it's really happening. Okay, so then we've gone through a few of those minor misbehaviors and we want to make sure that we are looking at those first with an instructional focus. So again, if everybody could make sure that they're muted um, during this time, because there's so many of us online, it would be helpful. Um, so the minor misbehaviors are addressed with an instructional focus, really important. And our mantra is going to be um, throughout this time, how am I as a teacher going to prevent this behavior from happening again. So that's that whole prevention focus. We're gonna, it happens, you're gonna to respond to it with what we're coming up with today, what we're gonna talk about, but then how are we gonna also plan ahead so that we're preventing that from happening again? Um, I also wanna call attention to the chat box. I've just um, posted a, a document that came out yesterday. It came out from the PBIS apps team. And Celeste, I don't know if you were on the phone, but I'm gonna shout out how wonderful and responsive your team is. And there's an article called A Four-Step Plan for Handling Problem Behaviors Remotely. It's the fourth step that I wanna call attention to. And that's when do we document behaviors? What we need to consider are the systems of how we document behaviors that are happening remotely. And so please, um, take a look at that document. It's an amazing document um, and it gives us some ideas of what we need to go back to of how we've already set up systems for documentation and how we can do that remotely. Okay, I'm gonna get rid of this chat box so I can see Barb, so hang on. So would you go back please to the continuum? Awesome, thanks Barb. So let's talk about really what we would want in any kind of response practice. We're really talking about an educational approach to support student learning and how they can demonstrate appropriate skills. And we're gonna tell you that teachers already have, we already have a toolkit that really has response practices, not one practice, but a continuum of respectful strategies that address challenging behaviors. In this toolkit, we talk about a continuum, but it's a continuum of intensity. And it's pretty um, important to know that one strategy, right, does not affect, is not effective for all kids or all behaviors. And so that's why we need this movement from least to most intense. So we want to have something that's very practical and um, we can, be able to do it and, and not something so out there that's not evidence-based, but sounds really great. Mm -hmm. uh, we wanna make sure that what's in our toolkit has the lens of what we know of trauma-informed educators, and that would be that our response practices should be able to support students to help them regulate, to connect with adults, and to allow problem solving. We wanna make sure that we focus on consistency and patience when we are responding, and that's our behavior. And any kind of response practice should be something that we communicate support, caring, and relationship building with our students. So here's what it's not. It's not a list of punishments, and it's definitely not a public shaming response cost system. Here are some non-examples of what it's not. It's <laughs> not glue sticks. <laughs> and it's not these contorted facial expressions when you give direct eye contact as a response strategy that will require you to have facials every week either. So those are some little examples, um, but we're gonna show you um, on the next slide, and we also have a document that's on the handout that you can download that has the definitions and descriptions 
of an example of a continuum. Remember, from least to most intense. And, and so page two of the handout, if, you're, if you've got the handout out. Yeah, so that would be there as well. And then a link, this came from the Midwest PBIS network. And we're just gonna briefly go through these, but we wanna make sure that you know that this isn't what your toolkit should look like. You shouldn't have all of these things in your toolkit. We can't. We're just giving you an example of what would be in your toolkit. What does your department or your grade level group agree on that would be in your classroom toolkit? Maybe two or three or four ways of responding to problem behavior from least to most intense. So um, again, that's part of system development. Um, to be able to do that. But here's an example of these practices from planned ignoring, which just means those attention seeking kids, you just ignore them, continue your instruction, to being able to signal or give that nonverbal cue, um, being able to, um, whatever that might be, direct them maybe back to your teaching matrix as just a signal. That physical proximity is just as powerful as you're just close and you're communicating, I notice you, I care about you, and I'm concerned. Giving direct eye contact, um, giving, again, that teacher look, but it's not the one that can torture your face so much that you have to have facials. Um, but I know that we all have that little eye look, right? Or the, I kind of add my smile, too, with the eye. Um, but then that, that just gave me wrinkles. So maybe I do need facials because of that, no. Um, being able to um, praise appropriate behavior in others. So that's kind of really telling the whole class, this is what we should be doing. This is what our expectations are for this particular routine, although you're really kind of directing it to that one student. And redirecting is going back what was it that we all agreed on for this routine, for this expectation? What does that look like? And what will we all acknowledge each other when we see it happening? Praise approximation is being able to, maybe for that one student or groups of students, look at what they're doing right. What's the appropriate behavior? And let them know and ignore the misbehavior. And I think a lot of these evidence-based practices, we've talked about this before when we did the classroom, are in that um, responding to problem behavior document that's at the pbs.org website. So it'll go into more definition. For example, when you're talking about the planned ignoring, you want to make sure that you're also adding into that your praise appropriate behaviors with others, you know, so that the planned ignoring will be more successful. So a lot of these happen simultaneously or together um, to be more powerful. The other thing I'm thinking that we have to start thinking about as kids come back to school and we begin to have where we're doing virtual as well as in classroom is that physical proximity. What are we going to do differently with that? And the direct eye contact is going to be important because we can't see our faces if we're our mouths if we're all um, wearing a mask. So things that we have to think about as we begin to uh, prepare for kids coming back at least part time. Um, as you go up this continuum, yes. And that's a really good cue as well to be all thinking about these are the response practices, an example of a continuum of response practices that we know is evidence based for the physical classroom. So please let's take that lens of what we're doing right now in that remote verbal virtual setting and how, how could this work. Um, maybe it can, maybe it can't. Mm -hmm. So please be like taking that to the relevancy of our work right now. Right. I know that our national centers are working crazily in order to um, see which one of these work and how they work better in our virtual classroom. So make sure you're checking with the pbs.org website regularly and as well as the um, PBIS apps website, both of them are putting up great documents. Um, so when we go up the continuum, the next thing we need to do is to reteach. So I think this is really good that this arrow changes and goes up because that up arrow while you're going up there to the reteach is to remind you to take a minute, take a beat, step back, take a really deep breath because by the time you get here and you're getting ready to reteach, you wanna make sure you're coming at it with the right um, tone of voice. <laughs> and one of the ways to do that is to step back. So we have to reteach what it is. That goes back to that quote that we heard earlier from um, Dr. Horner. 
We want to make sure that we're specific with our error corrections. We talked about that last time we got together about how do you give a um, specific error correction. Oh, excuse me, that was just with the high school. So some of you weren't online at the high school when we really went over that strategy of how you give specific error corrections. Um, we're going to talk about a little bit more with that and how you regulate um, the um, and, and relate to the students. So that's more about how you're going to hold yourself as you go back to talk with students. You wanna make sure that you're providing choice and you don't have to go there now, but on the very last page of your handout, there's an example of the um, ways that you're able to give choice, uh, multiple examples of different types of choice. I think there's like one, two, three, four, five, about seven of them, um, seven categories of choice making. Good reminder. And then next would be that you have to stop and conference with the student. And um, then the next step up would be restorative circles or a restorative conversation really um, with that student. And in those restorative conversations, you wanna make sure that you're helping understand what the situation was, what happened. So you wanna place that behavior in context. And why did you do that? So remind ourselves, we have to step back and take a look at what was the function of that behavior. What's the quickest way that we can think about why did you do that to get something or to avoid something? Um, the next question is, how did it make you feel? So we're tapping into now self-awareness, um, helping them think about what it was like for themselves. Um, then we wanna move into how do you think your behavior made other people feel? So now they're thinking about social awareness. So we're really tapping into what we know about social emotional learning. And then the next question is, what would you have um, done that would have been better for you to respond to that situation? What could you have done differently? So now we're helping the student define that replacement behavior that we're going to then help teach them how to do, but they can help come up with it themselves. And then what do you need to do in order to repair your certain your current situation? So that's what we're going to be able to teach that replacement behavior and help them be able to make that happen. What can you do next time the situation happens? The next question that we would do. And that's really helping us help them minimize what it is that they were getting out of the old behavior and how can they use the new behavior more. So this is all about self-empowering when you have these restorative conversations with students. And what help do you need from me? Or what help do you need from the whole group in order to make that help happen? So then you're establishing a common goal and that final question is so important in either whether it's restorative circle or restorative conversation with an individual student, but to help them carry over and make sure that happens. What can I do to help you? They own it, not us coming in to rescue and save them. So Chris is going to talk about our error corrections and what we need to be doing um, while I'm setting up the virtual classroom. So our question to you is going to be, what does it look like? But she's going to jump on now and give you these directions while I'm setting up the class, the, the breakout rooms. Oh, sure. I'll give you directions for that. Um, so one of the um, responses that Barbara went over was error correction. And that is the one that you can specifically find the definition, the example, the non-example, and then the evidence-based research and resources to support it. And that's in one of our documents, the supporting and responding to problem behavior document, but it's also in the handout, just this section. And I've been putting the link in the um, chat box for where you can get the handout and then all the other links to these documents that we're telling you about. Uh, so what we want you to do is think about error correction. How can you be brief, contingent, and specific when you're correcting um, a student's misbehavior? And as Barb went through, there's a continuum and it can be just prompting and you could stop there if the behavior changed, but it could move to redirect, reteach, provide choice, or even go into the conferencing with the student. So the biggest piece that we all have to remember is that when we are correcting an error, we're going to have a greater chance of our student complying and demonstrating that appropriate behavior if we stay calm, if we go back and 
take a moment, a meta moment to see, are we ready to address that behavior? Is my state in a place that if I ask the student or redirect, that student will comply? Because sometimes if my behavior is escalating through frustration, the student's behavior is more likely to escalate as well. So that's the biggest piece. And so how do we do that virtually? How would we stay consistent and let that student know now every time or all your students know that this is what error correction looks like. This is how I'm going to help you get back on track and be successful in the classroom. So consistency on our part is huge. And that really talks about transparency on our part to let the students know this is what it'll look like. And this is what I'll do. And this is what you'll do. And we have to be pretty immediate, right? We can't just like Three, three remote sessions later address that behavior. Um, and now we have opportunities to either have side chats or after remote, have a con conference set up just to talk about it. Um, but we always still want to be respectful and we want to be specific. So with if that. Turn, yeah, if you'll turn and look on page three, you'll have your guidelines because you're going to lose these notes when I put you in the breakout room about what does it look like in the virtual classroom when you're using prompting and redirecting and reteaching and providing choice um, and conferencing with the students. So I'm gonna send you to the chat rooms now. You're gonna to go to 20 different rooms. You'll have about 12 to 13 people in a room. Um, be sure to unmute and have conversations with each other. You'll be able to chat for about 10 minutes. I see many of you are starting to join your chat rooms. So as you join your chat rooms, everybody, go ahead and unmute yourselves and have your conversations with each other. I'm going to jump out of your chat room. Bye, everybody. All right, see ya. <laughs> I think I'm jumping out. Yes, I am. Well, thank you, Barbara. I guess I'm not leaving. <laughs> I clicked that. Oh, here. I, no, I don't want to end the meeting. I just want to leave the breakout room.
So Barb's muted. So I'm going to get started as soon as she's going to uh, unmute and somehow or another make myself small again and bring the PowerPoint back up. I'm trying. So excited that we have 216 participants even after the breakout rooms. A lot of times we lose people, but but I think once you've experienced how nice it is to have a conversation in that chat room, um, with, I mean the breakout rooms, you can tell. Okay, and then we've got two new chats. I just wanted to add while we're making this transition here, that mm -hmm. a reminder that these are all practices. So you still need to take a step back and take a look at your um, systems. If you're taking a look at how you're collecting data here, you're going to want to make sure that you go back and, and develop a system for how you're going to collect behavioral data. And that also includes like taking a look at your behavioral definitions. They're going to look really different when we're talking about what's tardy look like or not showing up at all to the virtual classroom and what do disruptions look like so that we can define them better in order to understand what it is that we need um, to teach. But right now we're just talking about this toolkit that is relying on these instructional practices, which is where we're going now. Right, um, and if you also put um, any great thoughts or suggestions or strategies you heard, um, please do that in the chat box, because what we actually do is take the transcripts from the chat box and we look at the strategies for that particular webinar, so we can share that with each other. So please feel I, free I to just ask that. A Quick question is is are you and everybody seeing my screen no i'm just seeing you oh you're not seeing the powerpoint anymore okay uh, no all right let me i have to end the show sometimes when i go in and out of the um chat boxes i mean the breakout rooms you come back and my i'm not sharing my screen anymore so let me fix that and somebody asked a question about, do you have a sample behavior matrix for virtual learning? So please go to an April webinar that we have done on looking at the foundations um, of the pre foundations of a PBIS classroom, and you'll see the examples. You'll also see a link to a document from the National Center on PBIS for uh, virtual learning, and they'll talk about those behavior matrix that you can use in your remote setting and i tried a couple times on the um, chat box to answer people's questions about where they can find some specific um answers in it's in their handout what pages to look on for like specific examples of what um choice making is all about and how do you give specific the steps to error correction so you'll find that in the handout and so as we move the last piece of the webinar it's that things that I know we're already doing, but keep these four keys to success in mind as we move through our virtual and remote classrooms. This is what we do know, that we need to take advantage of calm times. And in our physical classroom and in this virtual classroom, those are the times that we do our instruction and we teach and maybe we reteach the behaviors to help our students navigate successful, successfully no matter where they are. And there are four things to consider during these calm times. Um, we want to create that physical, emotional, and psychological safe environment. And we can do that by being predictable. So Barb, we wanna click on so they can, perfect, thanks. Um, so we want to, at this time, be able to establish our routines, um, maintain our structures, know how we transition from one breakout room or a chat to the other, but what's the predictability of that environment? And again, we talk about regulation, how important that is, that we can't teach it when behaviors have escalated, that it's these calm times that we can help support our kids manage their emotions and behaviors. And in just a few minutes, I'm gonna give you um, uh, a great uh, strategy that a teacher has actually created. Um, but the last one too is about resiliency. And for me to understand resiliency, it's what opportunities do we provide our kids to kind of recharge? If they have to pull from that reserve, how do we make sure that we can bounce back? So what kind of self-regulation strategies do we put in our toolkit? 
So this is, you can see the link on here. It was from Utopia and it was about a process for building student resiliency. And there are four documents. In the handout, we have the documents enlarged, um, but there are four steps. The first one is to teach students to identify their stressors. So how do you feel? I feel stressed when, I feel upset when, I feel sad when. So then you wanna be able to help the student um, identify what they normally do when those stressors are presented. And then there are some sentence starters that you can see when you're feeling stressed, when you're feeling upset and mad and feeling sad. And then the third thing is to brainstorm alternative ways to respond to those stressors. This is where our kids need help. Ooh, look at that, Barb. I don't know what that is. <laughs> That's okay, it's fine. Squiggle, uh, be yeah. here we have a squiggle. And to be able to self-reflect, super important when we're talking about our skills that we're developing, right? We're developing this resiliency skill, like identifying ourselves, looking how we react, but then like at a Likert scale, Likert scale of just from a scale of one to five. So, you know, how did I do when you did, did I, when I used this um, strategy? Did it make me feel worse or did it make me feel better? And then the last is really evaluating. So what's the practical application of this new skill? How did it work for me? So just a great way to frame our thoughts about how we can teach resiliency skills with our kids. We also wanna make sure that we're establishing those positive relationships. And we've been talking about that um, on multiple different webinars uh, over the last couple of months. So we just wanna remember that we help by helping all of our kids feel that they're respected and validated and that they're being heard. We do that by using our three to five behavioral expectations where we're teaching and we're modeling, we're reinforcing and we're being those, uh, using those to do the corrected behaviors. And then we want to make sure we're setting up our environment for success. So we have to think about our virtual environment. How are we structuring that space? How are we doing a behavioral matrix that is for our virtual classroom, establishing those routines that we need to have now, very different routines than we have in our um, classrooms, in-person classrooms. How do we model and teach those expectations? How do we positively always interact with our students? And I think we have to go back to some of those really important relationship building um, strategies that we know about. We want to be the healthy adult that's in their life um, at school. That's what they're missing. A lot of them um, from home to school, they're used to us being there, always being there for them. We want to make sure we're learning about what are they interested in and uh, we want to respond in a timely way to their requests so that they don't feel left out and that we're not responding to everybody equally validate their concerns even though they may not be our concerns how do we validate their concerns and then take them to the next step of problem solving we want to acknowledge those positive efforts that they're making um, that's part of the work behind improving the attendance is acknowledging their steps towards um, being better at attending and suspend our own judgment about what's going on those are the things and i think another important one here in relationships is just to be um, transparent, transparent with them when there's things that are happening that we can't change or we can't avoid in our environment. Um, be transparent with them. Help, help them be problem solvers with us. I have no idea where that little squiggle line came from. <laughs> it just developed on its own. But we want to be reminded, this is a quote from Teddy Roosevelt, that really they don't care how much you know until they, I mean, they don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. So it's important that we continue. And that's one of the things that kids are telling us they're really missing is the care and love that they receive from their teachers. So another key to success is to think about where and when triggers might occur for kids. What might set them off um, to get them off task or not engaged? So we want to try to develop an environment that avoids those conditions, of course, but we can't always do that. That's not realistic, but we can step back and say, gosh, you know, when did that happen for that student? Oh, when, when they had to go to that chat room or that breakout room, they, 
they disconnect it. Um, so be thinking about that to be able to support our kids. We can go into the ABCs of behavior. I know there's a lot of BCBA people out there right now, but we're not gonna talk about that so much as right now what we, can we do? And that's to kind of observe what's going on in your remote learning. Um, we pull one of those prevention practices back in, active supervision. We can actively supervise even remotely. And by doing that, we could be kind of examining um, and looking and observing at what, what some of those triggers might be for our kids. So in the chat box, we um, invite you again to think of some triggers that you have observed um, going on with some of your students during remote learning. Um, anything that might trigger their misbehavior. Because once we do that, we can then anticipate what they'll do and then we can restructure that um, setting or that routine to help them re-engage. The other thing that we wanna do um, is to make sure that we're consistent. Um, we know that inconsistencies are confusing and they raise um, potential errors for kids. Uh, kids will make mistakes with their behavior that they may not have made without if we stay consistent with what it is that we're doing. And this is again a, ta a time to talk about being transparent, that we want to um, teaching our error corrections and being transparent on what's happening and the why and what's causing it uh, so that everybody can learn for that when we use our, our error correction. And this is really where you can use the choice a lot um, when you're working with students. So how can we be consistent with the fact that we're always going to give you choice? We're not going to one day go, no, you have to do it this way and that's it. We have to be consistent with our choices and what they look like. So I mentioned this earlier that on the last page of your handout these are the seven categories of choice making and with those seven categories um, you'll notice that in our career error correction it's after prompting redirecting reteaching and providing choice and it's a good time for us to bring up you don't necessarily have to go in this order you may decide that in your earlier instruction, you'd already done enough prompting and redirecting, you're actually going to be able to help the student quicker if you go right to remind our, remind them of our choices. What were our choices? Which one of those do you want to use right here? Um, and that will help with de-escalating um, some of the student's behavior even virtually. It's critical that we remain in control of our own emotions. When we escalate our behavior, it's a giant predictor that the student's behavior will escalate as well. So again, just take a deep breath, right? And don't take things personal. And my mantra is, if Barb can move to the next slide, <laughs> my mantra is that my brain should resemble a thermostat rather than a thermometer when it comes to disciplining a student. And so I think the visual kind of says it all. And we don't want our students to be in this reptilian brain, which is the, the red thermo, uh, temperature. Um, we want our kids to be calm and relaxed so that they can, or both of us working together, can problem solve and make decisions about how to get um, everybody back on track and engaged in our learning. There is an article um, that we have that's in the, the link to that article on co-regulation and discipline. And it's about the student teacher relationship where both feel safe and connected even when the students make that poor choice. And we want us adults to have this regulated calm brain state because it takes a calm brain to calm another brain. That's why I love the dragons. I just have to mention that. I think they're very cute, reminding us about what we need to do as we go up the thermometer with our own temperatures. There's also a great resource. It's actually a toolkit for us as educators on compassion resilience. And that is something defined in the education field as the ability to maintain our physical, emotional, and mental well-being, which is using our energy productively. 
while compassionately identify and addressing the stressors that are barriers to learning for students. So this is a great resource. Um, it's free um, and you can actually use it for yourself. You can use it for, there's a family kit as well. You could extend that to you and your own personal family or to the families of your students. Um, but take a look at it. There's also for administrators. So don't think that if you're not a teacher, you can't be a part of the Compassion Resilience Toolkit. But I like the idea that we really um, feel um, and are aware of others' distress and we really want to alleviate that. But sometimes we're out of, Somebody had said that too. We don't have the control to be able to do that. So what will we do so that we can really know what the reality is? Um, we can't fix everybody's problem and their pain, um, but this is a great toolkit for us, both heart, spirit, strength, and mind. So we encourage you to take a look at this great tool. And as we continue and hear again that we're gonna be at least another three months in the stay at home phase, um, we need to really work on this compassion and resilience, or at least I'm going to say I do. I'm, I'm to the point where, oh yeah, this is going to be a while and I better figure out how to handle it. All right, so we're bringing it to a close today. We just have a couple more minutes. want to remind you about completing the evaluation for the webinars. Um, May 15th, we're going to be taking a look at these, the, the committee that comes together across the state and planning the webinars for June based on things that you're telling us you want. One of the final questions is, is what is something else that you need to know about? Because of these evaluations, we have several of the webinars that we're repeating this month that people have asked to see again or to be uh, participants in. So please be sure to fill out this eval. And I think Christy has posted or is posting is posting the URL. Yeah, is posting the URL so you can catch it again, or you can always catch it when you um, download the, the PowerPoints as well. And it's also on the very first page of your handout. That's where the list of all the URLs from today are, all of the connections. I want to remind you that we are still having the conference. Um, we're not sure if it's going to be um, a virtual conference or if it's going to be an in-person conference. It really depends on what the governor says so it depends on where we are in california and and we'll be making that decision within probably the next two to three weeks um, hopefully you would be able to attend the conference is september 21st through the 22nd um, otherwise it again whatever we do we'll be making sure we post online so what i put in the chat box are the links to the california pbis conference to the webinar evaluation and then the third link is the link to um, the CPC um, Community Cares, um, what we're going to be doing instead of the recognition system this year. So you have that link is there for you to see, but it's also in the um, chat box as well. And we invite all schools doing wonderful, marvelous things to share their story. And I think if you click on there, you can tell your story by June 30th. And it would be wonderful to hear from every school, everybody that we want, um, that wants to, about what you're doing in response to this virtual. There's amazing things happening in California, and we'd like to be able to share them with everybody. So this is your place to be able to do that. Again, just to remind you, there's more events coming up this month, and this is just a list. If you go to the URL um, on the very first page, or the one that's here on this page, or just go to uh, pbisca.org um, and go to upcoming events, you'll be able to see all the events that are there. Some repeating and some that are new. This is just a thank you from the coalition for all coming together. And again, thanks to Stephanie for getting us all on board and making sure this happens. And again, the pbisca.org website is there. Christy and I also want to thank you. Our um, contact information is there in case you want a copy of the PowerPoint. Um, and also, if you want to go to the California Technical Assistance Center on PBIS, we have several pages of one of them that's just about responding to the COVID response. Um, as we hear things from across the nation, we post them there so that you have access to that. And it's another resource for you. Christy, do you want to say goodbye? Goodbye, everybody. 
It was so nice to connect, having that human connection um, for an hour of my day today, and especially in the breakout rooms, appreciated that as well. And I just feel so close to you because I've been monitoring your chats. So hope to chat again. This is a chance for us all to wave to each other, say hi, say goodbye as you hang up. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank bye. you for your support. Oh, yes. We have to figure out how to give big hugs. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Enjoy the resources. Oh, hi. We have a young student joining us, <laughs> Mr. Lopez. <laughs> Take care. Bye bye. Bye bye. Okay. Oh, good. We needed that voice. Hi, Marie. All right, I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording. I am going to download the save chat. Okay, and I'm going to um,